In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and for the grace to make this time a prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. The three archangels whose feast we celebrate this week are kind of like reflections of different aspects of God. They reflect different divine qualities or different divine perfections. This is from a homily on the angels by St. Gregory the Great. St. Gregory writes, Some angels are given proper names to denote the service they are empowered to perform. Thus Michael means, Who is like God? Gabriel is the strength of God, and Raphael is God's remedy, or God heals. And so those three archangels, each one of whose name ends in El, which is God in Hebrew, each one of them reflects something about God. Michael means who is like God, Gabriel is the strength of God, and Raphael is God's remedy, or God heals. St. Gregory goes on, Whenever some act of wondrous power must be performed, Michael is sent, so that his action and his name may make it clear that no one can do what God does by his superior power. So also our ancient foe desired in his pride to be like God, saying, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. I will be like the Most High. Michael, Mikael, who is like God? In Latin, it's translated, qui sicut Deus. Michael's name is a question, and the question is rhetorical. No one is like God, it is the answer. And Michael's name is a direct response to Satan's rebellious claim to be equal to God. At the moment of his creation, at the moment of his freedom, Satan turns his will towards himself and against God. He says, non serviam, I will not serve. He diabolically rejects God's superior excellence. He refuses to recognize his debt to his creator. He refuses to serve out of love him who created him out of love. Satan blasphemously claims, I am God, not you. And so the name Michael, Satan's great enemy, the name Michael asks, who is like God? And the answer is no one. God alone is God, uncaused, uncreated, the source of all goodness and perfection, infinite subsisting love. Who is like God? It's as if Michael is saying to Satan and all sinners, come on, get over yourself. No one is like God but God. And maybe these days we can imagine him sarcastically adding, then how's that working out for you? Right? Satan has a certain power. He's the prince of the world. He has a certain power over the world until the end of time. But in the end, however, he'll be utterly defeated. He's, and he's defeated by Michael. This is from the book of Revelation. And now war broke out in heaven when Michael with his angels attacked the dragons. The dragon fought back with his angels, but they were defeated and driven out of heaven. The great dragon, the primeval serpent, known as the devil or Satan, who had deceived all the world, was hurled down to the earth, and his angels were hurled down with him. Then I heard a voice shout from heaven, Victory and power and empire forever 
have been won by our God and all authority for his Christ. Now that the persecutor who accused our brothers day and night before our God has been brought down. This is a vision of the ultimate defeat of Satan. And it's a vision of the future. It's a reassuring vision. We're on the winning side. We're on the right side. It's kind of like a Hollywood action movie, or at least some of them. Certainly, the older ones, this was always the case. In a good action movie, you know that the good guy will win in the end. No matter how bad it seems, no matter how bad things get, you know that the good guy will win. And the bad guy, the villain, no matter how bad he is, no matter how much damage he does along the way, no matter how many people he hurts or even kills, you know he's not going to win. More than that, he's going to he's going to get his comeuppance, right? Probably there'll be a long fight scene in the end, and the good guy will really do some damage and inflict some pain on the bad guy before probably killing him in some gruesome way. And this is the story of of Michael and, and the devil. This is the story of Christ and the devil. We're on the winning side. The only trick is to stay in it, to stay in the fight, to stay on that side. It's very powerful. Every Easter vigil as part of the rite of baptism and the rite of acceptance of new Christians into the church, we renew our baptismal promises. Do you reject Satan? We're asked. And we respond, I do. And all his works, I do. And all his empty promises, I do. And these are good questions, but are they are they true, Lord? Do I truly reject sin? Do I truly reject temptation? Do I truly reject my self-centeredness? All those ways that that as a sinner I'm I'm like I'm like the devil. I I, I say I want to be God. I want to replace God. I reject God's rule. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. I will be like the most high God. And our pride, pride is the root of all sin. We could tell our Lord now with Michael's help, Lord, I do. I reject Satan and all his works and all his empty promises. And St. Michael has a special power over evil. And so in moments of temptation, moments of moral trial, It's good to go to St. Michael. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in the battle. And St. Michael will rout the devil. He routs the devil if the devil is involved. And he reminds us to be strong in putting first things first. Who is like God? Put God first. Put God in first place. And when we see evil making progress in the world, or we see the results of evil and sin in the world, as we do in so many ways today, It's good to go to St. Michael. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in the battle. Be our protection. Who is like God? Qui sequit Deus? No one. No one. Does my prayer life say this, Lord? Does my prayer life ask the world, who is like God? Does my prayer life, the amount of time I spend in prayer, my confidence in you. Tell the world, no one is like God for me. This is the deep meaning of celibacy in the church, in the priesthood, and in the church in general. Celibacy for the love of God, foregoing marriage and a natural family for the love of God is a way of, of proclaiming to the world this question, who is like God? No one is like God. God can, f- can fulfill my heart, fill my heart completely. No one is like God. Whoever has God lacks nothing. Lord, help us to reject Satan and his empty works. Satan forever will be filled with rage, with hatred, 
with regret. Right? The path of sin leads to this rage and hatred and regret, sadness, impotent, powerless desire to avenge himself on God, which is just totally frustrating. And Michael responds, who is like God? How's that working out for you, Satan? <laughs> Not, how's that, how's that choice, right? Not accepting God as God. Gabriel, St. Gabriel. Gabriel means the strength of God, fortitudo Dei. So Gabriel reflects the mystery of God's infinite power. And so it's fitting that, that the greatest wonder, one of the greatest Miracles, works of God, the Incarnation, is brought about by Gabriel's agency that Gabriel will announce this wonderful, marvelous, seemingly impossible work of God, that God becomes man without losing his divinity and without crushing the humanity, without diluting either nature. The wonderful mystery of the Incarnation is announced by an angel who, whose name means the strength of God, for Tutudo Dei, the power of God. And Mary herself wonders exactly how God will bring this about. It seems impossible to her to be a mother and a virgin at the same time. She knows that she's called to give her whole heart to God, her whole body to God, her whole soul to God in virginity. And Gabriel comes and says, you will be the mother of the Messiah. And so Mary asks that question, how can this be since I have no husband? And she wants to know, how, how, how can God do this? How will he do this? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And so, so Gabriel, whose name precisely means the strength of God, answers Mary's question by appealing precisely to the strength of God, to the power of God. How can this be? Mary asks. And Gabriel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High, the strength of God, will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. The strength of God. With God, nothing will be impossible. Before this, of course... Gabriel visited Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. And we see there that Gabriel doesn't take kindly to those who doubt the power of God. Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife has advanced in years. Gabriel had just finished telling Zechariah that Elizabeth will conceive and bear a son, John the Baptist. And Zechariah doubts God's ability to do this. How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife has advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, who stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things come to pass, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Gabriel, the strength of God. And Gabriel, again, you know, his chastisement of Zechariah appeals to the power of God, the power of God's words. You do not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. These things will come to pass. Jesus Christ, 
Lord, you are God's amazing power on our behalf. And our trust in you, Lord, in a certain sense, makes that power our own. Gabriel says to Our Lady, For God, nothing will be impossible. Lord, you, in your encounter with a man whose son was possessed by a demon who tortured him, you ask his father, How long has he had this? And the man said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. So many saints, including St. Saint Josemaria, have used this aspiration as an act of faith and an act of, of petition for more faith. I believe, help my unbelief. And Jesus says, all things are possible to him who believes. Why? Because of the strength of God. Right? The strength of God. So trusting God unlocks God's strength on our behalf. With faith, Lord, your strength is my strength. With faith, Lord, you become my strength. With faith, Lord, your strength becomes the very shape of our lives. It's what keeps us trying when things are difficult. It's what keeps us getting up when things seem totally bleak. It's what keeps us loving and serving when perhaps our efforts seem futile. Faith in you. Trust that God's strength will work through us and is working through us. Gabriel, the strength of God. Finally, we consider the archangel Raphael. Raphael means God's remedy or God heals. In the book of Tobit, Tobias the elder is blinded by some rather pesky birds he falls asleep under a tree and the birds in the tree decide to loose their droppings in his eyes. And they seem to be particularly aggressive birds with particularly virulent droppings because poor, poor Tobias the Elder ends up blind from this, <laughs> from this incident. And Raphael, among other things in that, in that book, precisely heals Tobias the Elder from his blindness. He provides a remedy to that problem. And he provides a remedy to Tobias the Younger's problems. God heals. God makes us whole again. God makes us healthy again. We all need this healing, Lord. I need to be healed by you. Sin, Lord, is a big wound in my soul, and my sins leave wounds in my soul. They need the healing of your mercy, the healing of your forgiveness. St. John the Apostle, who was so insistent that God is love, was also insistent that we need precisely the mode of God's love, the, the, the aspect of God's love, which is forgiveness, which is mercy. St. John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Lord, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Heal us from the wounds caused by our sins. Our sins, Lord, and also the, also heal us from, from the wounds that the sins of others have inflicted upon us. We're sinners, and so we have, treat, we have treated others poorly. We have treated God poorly. We've inflicted wounds. But we've, we've, also, we've also received the wounds of, of the mistreatment of others. And God is the remedy. God heals. God's remedy. Raphael. 
Those who are well have no need of a physician, Jesus says, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And so Jesus compares himself to a doctor who heals the sick. And this is this is very interesting. This is um, tied to the concept of salvation. Right? The word salus in in Latin is the word that the, the church uses for salvation. That when Jesus saves us, he brings us to salus. But salus also means health. And and health it basically means soundness, right? That we're returned to a certain integrity, that precisely that we're healed. And so sometimes we think of salvation that we think of salvation as like a kind of ticket to Disneyland, right? That if, we, if we're if we saved when we die, we get this ticket to go to heaven where we'll be happy, but pretty much we'll be the same people. And our Lord's our Lord's salvation is much deeper than that. We will get to heaven because we've learned how to love God above all things, which means that our soul and our our existence, right, our person, will be healed. That's what we're made for. We'll be brought back to integrity, to to functionality that's proper to our nature. And so salvation is not just some sort of exterior state where, you know, I'm moved from kind of a a difficult situation to being in a happy situation. Depending on like circumstances, where I am or what's going on around me. No, salvation is, is the return of health to the soul, to the person. The Greek word for savior is soter which is where we get the word soteriology. Soteriology is is a branch of theology which studies salvation, salvation in Christ. But the word soter, which means means savior, um, also and more originally means healer. Right? That Christ the savior is Christ the healer. He returns us to wholeness, to health. And this is this is also the deep meaning of purgatory. Right? Purgatory is not just, okay, you've been bad, and so you're going to go into this particularly difficult timeout, right? Like when a kid is bad, he gets sent to timeout, and he can't play or do anything. He's just going to sit there and bide his time so he can be free again. No, pur- purgatory is the place where our souls precisely are purified. And in that purification, they're made better, right? They're made capable of seeing God. They're made capable of going to heaven to see God. And so heaven is not just uh, an external reward. It's not just, okay, now we can see God and that will make us happy. No, heaven is is, um, also at the same time the returning to health of the soul such that that the soul has become capable of seeing God. Right, capable of loving God forever. And this is the meaning of, of Raphael's name, God's remedy, salvation. Sin makes us incapable of being with God. Sin wounds our soul, incapacitates our soul, such that we can't love God and we can't love others. We can't even love ourselves as we should. And God's remedy in Jesus Christ, salvation is the returning of health to the soul, making our souls capable once again of true love, love of God and love of others and love of ourselves. Our Lady is the Queen of the Angels. And so when we celebrate this feast of the archangels, our minds naturally go to her. Like Michael, she says, who is like God? 
And in that, she undoes the rejection of God by Adam and Eve. Our Lady steps on the head of the serpent. Our Lady crushes the head of the serpent who says, non serviam. And she does this precisely by, by saying, Fiat me he secundum verbum tuum, be it done unto me according to your word. Who is like God? God has no rival in my heart, no rival in my life. I want my whole being, my whole person to be whatever he wants it to be, whatever, whatever his word is. And Our Lady, unlike Zechariah, trusts that God's word will be fulfilled in her. This is the great compliment that Elizabeth pays to Our Lady. Elizabeth says to Mary in the visitation, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of the words spoken to her by God. Blessed is she who believed that God's words would come to pass. And so Our Lady believed in God's power, believed in God's strength. Gabriel brings her this message, the strength of God, the power of God. And then Raphael, God's, God's remedy, God's salvation. And Our Lady is a protagonist in this, in this remedy, in this salvation. Right? Without Our Lady's yes, our Lord as Savior would not have been born into the world. Right? Our Lady's yes makes the incarnation possible, brings it about. And the incarnation is precisely the reunion of man and God in the person of Jesus Christ. The incarnation is salvation. And then at the foot of the cross, when our Lord makes up for our sins and redeems us in, in his Paschal mystery on the cross, our lady at the foot of the cross becomes co-redemptrix, co-redeemer. And she sees what our Lord is doing she sees the remedy that he's providing and she says, yes, I want to second our Lord's salvation. I want to be a protagonist in this remedy. And so supporting her son at the foot of the cross, saying yes to God's plan, she becomes a co-redeemer, a help to Christ in his redemption of the world. And so we go to Our Lady and we ask her, help these aspects of God reveal to us in the names of the three archangels. Who is like God, the great transcendence of God? Michael. God's strength, the great power of God, unlo unlocked by faith, unlocked by trust in God. Gabriel. And God's remedy God's healing, God's returning my life and my soul to health, to vigor, to vitality, the restoration of my ability to love, Raphael, God's remedy, God's heal, God heals. Our Lady, Queen of the Angels, help me to, to figure out the ways in which I need each one of these aspects to be more active in my life. The ways in which I need to say, God is number one. Who is like God? And the ways in which I need to say, God is strong and powerful. I trust in his action in my life and in the world. And the ways in which I need to say, God heals. I let him heal me in repentance and confession. I let him heal me in my, in my effort to grow in all the virtues that Christ wants us to grow in both human and supernatural virtues. Our Lady Queen of Angels, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.